Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome, welcome. We're super excited to uh, start the plenary panels. One of my favorite things about the SWS conference is that we do all, for some part of it, sit in a room together and uh, have a conversation collectively, all of us. Um, and so I really enjoy these sessions. Um, and as president, I got to uh, plan these sessions. So it's pretty super exciting to me. Um, the the first um, plenary uh, panel, I wanted to organize around reproductive justice, gender and sexual justice. In, and it's called Reproductive Gender and Sexual Justice in a Non-Binary Utopia, because I think very often um, that we think of reproductive justice and um, gender equity and uh, gender performativity as sort of different streams of work. And I'm hoping to have those uh, paths come together and have a collective conversation about that. So we've invited some scholars who are gonna help us sort of cover the breadth of that. And without much ado, I will introduce to you Austin Johnson from Kenyon College. Thank you so much for being here today and thank you as for organizing this and all the folks who put so much work into this conference. Um, one thing I love about SWS is that there's inspiration around every corner and over every mill, including this one and the casual chats that you have in the morning or late at night over drinks or coffee. And in the spirit of taking full advantage of that vibe, I've organized my comments around uh, three eruptions or emergences of thought that I've had while I've been at SWS that kind of relate to oh, just the past 24 hours that relate to the work that I've been doing over the past 10 years on trans identities and how we think about them and the popular imagination. Um, the first point I wanna make is on identity categories. Um, last year, I had the incredibly good fortune to teach a course uh, on the life and works of W.E.B. Du Bois and the impact he had and the barriers he faced um, in sociology in a session uh, for one of our courses centered on working with, against, and outside of socially constructed categories I had them read uh, Du Bois' 1940 Dusk of Dawn, uh, specifically the chapter six called The White World. And I'm gonna read you a passage of that text um, that has been on my mind since I read it. Um, in all of my thinking and writing about trans experiences in the last year, I've come back to these passages repeatedly. Du Bois writes, it is easy to see that scientific definition of race is impossible. It is easy to prove that physical characteristics are not so inherited as to make it possible to divide the world into races. The ability is the monopoly of no known aristocracy, that the possibilities of human development cannot be circumscribed by color, nationality, or any conceivable definition of race. All this has nothing to do with the plain fact that throughout the world today, organized groups of men by monopoly of economic and physical power, legal enactment and intellectual training are limiting with determination and unflagging zeal the development of other groups and that the concentration particularly of economic power today puts the majority of mankind into a slavery to the rest. Du Bois wrote that in 1940, in Dusk of Dawn, and it was written against the implications of scientific racism and social Darwinism of the day. It rejected social ideas in circulation that social inequalities were the result of inferior bodies, not institutional practice, and that those bodies belonged to certain kinds of people who could be verifiably identified, monitored, and controlled. For Du Bois, race as a category was not meaningful because it was essential to the individual, but because it was essential to the social treatment and life chances of groups of individuals. In the same essay from Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois imagines an inevitable conversation where he explains the institutional creation of the material realities of race and of other social categories. Du Bois writes, no, no, human beings are infinite in variety. And when they are agglutinated in groups, great and small, the groups differ as though they too had integrating souls. But they have not. The soul is still individual if it is free. Race is a cultural, sometimes an historical fact. And all that I really have been trying to say is that a certain group that I know and to which I belong, as contrasted with the group you know and to which you belong, and in which you fanatically and glorifyingly believe bears in its bosom just now the spiritual hope of this land because of the persons who compose it and not by divine command. But what is this group, his imagined interlocutor asked? How do you differentiate it? And how can you call it black when you admit it is not black? Du Bois responds, I recognize it quite easily and with full legal sanction. 
the black man is a person who must write Jim Crow in Georgia. I offer that passage to you and I offer that to my students and I thought about it almost every day since I taught it because I think that we are doing similar things to trans bodies in the United States and around the world today um, through, through the laws we create. So in 2024, what is this group we call trans and how do we differentiate that? And how can we call it trans when some of us admit that there is no such thing as trans, that gender is socially constructed? If there is no there there, what is there that we are analyzing? Much like Du Bois, we can recognize trans quite easily and with full legal sanction when we see it. The trans person is a person whose gendered bodily autonomy is restricted by the state. And the state is currently working hard to define, restrict, and limit gendered bodily autonomy in innumerable ways for innumerable lives. That was my first point on categories. My second point is on anti-trans legislation. The ACLU rang an alarm in 2021. It was the most active year on record for anti-trans LGBTQ political action in the history of the United States. The panic was not unfounded. In the 2021 legislative session, lawmakers introduced 144 bills across 37 states, only passing 18 of them, but successfully fomenting a political strategy against LGBTQ people and particularly trans people that a Republican governor referred to at the time as vast government overreach. This political agenda continued to mount in 2022 with lawmakers passing 26 additional bills. And in 2023, lawmakers across 23 U.S. states introduced 510 anti-LGBTQ bills, passing 84 of them into law in the last year's session alone. This groundswell of political harassment results in negative consequences for trans people. Uh, certain researchers tracking these 2023 bills estimate that four-fifths of the bills explicitly seek to limit access to gender-affirming health care for trans youth and young adults, a population that experiences stigma-induced depression, anxiety, and suicidality at nearly twice the rate of their cisgender peers. As anti-trans legislative efforts continue to mount, there is simultaneous increase in the negative rhetoric associated with trans lives. No matter the content of the bill, the rhetoric heightens in order to support those who are positioning those bills for discussion or debate or just for fodder in the future war that surround them. As part of my work at the Campaign for Southern Equality Research and Policy Center, I've seen the direct effects of these laws in the lives of trans youth in firsthand over the last couple of years. About a year ago, our organization recognized the growing need for healthcare access. And in solidarity with reproductive justice organizations, created the Southern Trans Youth Emergency Project. If you're not familiar with that, you can go to southernequality.org slash STYEP, S-T-Y-E-P. You can get more information. STYEP offers direct financial support and resources to trans youth and their families in the Southern United States and in states that are adjacent to the South, people who need help here there. Over the last year, we've deployed, deployed more than $300,000 in direct aid to LGBTQ families or LGBTQ youth and their families who need the support. I say this not as a way to toot my own horn about uh, organizing or to say this is really great work we're doing, but because I want to draw your attention to the way we decided to give that money based on my first point. It was not an identity-based model. It was not, are you trans and do you require gender-affirming care? It was, are you experiencing barriers to accessing the care that you need that is currently being restricted by the state? Rather than, are you transgender, this question opens up uh, opportunities to address people's limitations and barriers that they are experiencing in the practices of the institutions they exist in, not on the ways that we understand their identities from an outside perspective. There's been, this has been an incredible opportunity for me as a researcher um, who thinks about gender identity to see how sex, gender, and embodiment are being negotiated in real time among young people, their families, and social institutions. These active negotiations around not identity, but about their body, about their happiness, about what works for them in their daily life takes precedent over some predetermined understanding of what's right for them by their parents, by their educators, by their doctors, or by nonprofit administrators who may think they know better. When we center the needs of people who come to us, um, we can kind of get around the identity barrier. The third point I want to come to, and this is my final point and I'll wrap up, is this idea of Queer co-mingling and social reproduction in a post-binary utopia. We were tasked on this panel with thinking about gender, sexual reproduction, and sexuality in a non-binary utopia. Um, and, and I want to push us toward a more post-binary utopia. I want to go back to Du Bois real quick. In 2024, what do we call this group trans? And how do we differentiate from other folks? Much like Du Bois, I said, we recognize it with this full legal sanction the limited gendered bodily autonomy and the limited social reproduction that is imposed on us by the state. Much like our historical reaction to non-normative bodies in public space, 
We are creating new definitions that are in opposition to, but ultimately reliant on and responsive to the terms of the conversation by hegemonic structures. Those that rely on innate gender identities that are identifiable, verifiable, and generalizable by medical science. I see this in our movement response to anti-trans legislation when we argue for right to change our bodies based on med medical diagnosis or parental consent. Our movement slogans or campaign messages that privilege medical or parental authority over our individual bodily autonomy and morphological self-determination reinforce those dominant structures that regulate gender across social contexts. In doing so, they continue to restrict and manipulate individual experiences and emergences of gender. My work with young people has shown me this directly, but also uh, a reading that was shared by a colleague called Queer Theory for Lichen by a writer named David Griffiths. I'm gonna read you a passage from this. David, after reading this, I shared this with all my students and said they couldn't come to my office hours unless they read the article because we were gonna talk about it for five mm -hmm. minutes at least. And it's this ecological understanding of gender that the, relies on an assemblage model that understands that gender is both meaningful and unstable, that it is incredibly real and also fleeting, that it has the power to structure our lives and also that we have the power to structure it in our lives as we move through it. So I wanna share this passage. David writes, what is clear in these scaled multi-species ecologies of lichen is that sexual reproduction and vertical inheritance are only part of the picture and that it is the heteronormative misinterpretation of life and nature to overemphasize these. Ecological perspectives reveal a queer commingling, the production and reproduction of life between vastly different scales. This challenges the notion of individual discrete human bodies and the privileging of sexual reproduction in public discourse. According to this ecological view, trans identity is produced within and without individuals. That's me adding to Griffiths. Here's Griffiths again. The symbiotic view of life suggests we are not individuals and that we have never been. While the traditional view of organisms is that they are self-contained, discrete, and autonomous, scientific research is increasingly suggesting that this is misleading. And I would add scientific research on gender identity has always suggested that this is misleading. This is illustrated in the symbiotic bacterial relationships we have with all of life. The article suggests that we can't see ourselves as separate because we are never separate. The air I breathe is the air you breathe. I would like to bring this back to our understanding of gender identity as an ecological mesh, as David Griffith understands it. That line is gender as an ecological mesh has stuck in my head worse than a Taylor Swift vault track lyric, I must admit. Um, if life and nature are to be found everywhere, it is not autonomous individuals that contain it, right? But it's this con it's constitutive of co-minglings, involvements, and interconnected relationships that make up this ecological mesh. On identities, on categories, and all that, I want to tell you a, a brief story, and then I'm going to wrap up. This is the last thing. In the fewer, fewer than 24 hours since I've been here, I've experienced that ecological mesh of my own gender identity. I first learned about SWS um, as an undergraduate student in South Carolina, and I identified as a woman at the time. I did not identify as queer. I think I identified as a gay woman. I was very seriously not queer from my Southern rural town. I found that very offensive. Um, I identified as a gay woman was my gender identity. Over time, that gender identity shifted to butch and it was very meaningful to me. And both being a gay woman, being a butch identified person, those meant something to me. They, they structured my life. As a graduate student, I attended SWS in 2014 as a trans man. That was the identity I chose. That was, I think that was the identity I put on a form or on a badge or something at the time. And it meant a lot to me. And today I think I sit here on this panel and I identify the person who uses he, him pronouns and prefers masculine honorifics. But that gender identity I have today and the gender identity I had yesterday, none of those are less meaningful, right? They all kind of structured my experience and understanding gender as a co-mingling versus something that was medically identified and maybe that I moved away from allows all of those things to emerge together so that we can have this beautiful ecological mesh of gender and sexuality research together. So with those thoughts, I, I suggest move toward a post-binary utopia to do away with gender social categories whose meanings are too rigid and too fixed move towards theories of identities that are open and fluid and emergent and move toward a post-binary theory of gender that is not limited to um, the way that states and institutions divide our identities, but include our bodily autonomy and self-determination. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And we will hold question and answer till the end. So I'd like to you know, go to our next presenter uh, who is our uh, program committee chair as well, Piper Sledge from University of Arizona. Hi, um, thank you all for being here. I know you have to be here because it's where the lunch is, but um, <laughs> it's still cool that you're here in this room instead of cooking your lunch and wandering out to 
all of the beauty around us. Um, so uh, I've been thinking with rivers for the past couple of years, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to say today to such a large captive audience. Um, so I went to the river. Um, and I will admit I broke the rules, I jumped the fence, um, and I wanted to be able to listen more attentively. It's hard to listen when there's a barrier, right? So on this walk to the Rio yesterday, um, I was thinking about medicine and health and queer and trans folks, and I was letting kind of all of the, the fear and the anger um, of this current moment kind of run over me like water in the rapids. So I'm walking along letting this anger and fear happen. And then I actually heard the rapids and they're not big, massive, profound rapids um, across this bench here. They're, they're manageable ones. Um, and as I kind of started to hear the water, right? I calmed down, there's sort of this peace, right? And I started to think about opportunities for hope and community to this point about utopia, right? And so in that moment, as I was turning this bend in the trail and the water was becoming loud in my ears, um, I found myself thinking about my dentist. So I just moved to Tucson this summer um, and I had a minor dental emergency, which meant I really needed to find a dentist and I needed to find one fast. Um, so a colleague recommended somebody to me, I made an appointment and the course of things meant I had to make a couple of different appointments. I had to go back a few times. Um, and on the second, um, visit, I saw a different dentist than the first time. And instead of beginning to talk about the dental emergency and these things that were happening, she started asking me about my name and why I'd moved to Tucson and all these sorts of things. Um, and I realized she was trying to determine if I was the same Piper Sledge who wrote a book about the medical regulation of gendered bodies, which was not what I expected in this moment. Um, but from there, she came out as trans. Um, and the rest of the visit, which was a decent length visit, was this dentist talking to me about her transition and being a trans healthcare provider and how patients are responding and all of these things. And so as it turns out, right, other members of my family start going through this dental practice. Um, and each one of us became sort of audience um, collaborator, uh, witness to different aspects of this dentist's experience as a trans healthcare provider. Um, and I started to realize that she was looking for reassurance. She was looking for community. She was looking for a patient population who would not sort of be flustered by the goings on. And all this time I'm thinking, just please fix my tooth. It really hurts. Right. Um, and so with each of us, she had a sort of different approach to the ways she was looking for community, right? And so um, with me, it was one version, it was very medically focused with my partner, it was this other version. Um, it was also rather scientifically focused since my partner is an astrophysicist. Um, and with our daughter, it was about how to talk with her kids about transitioning and what language to use to refer to herself to their friends and all these other things. So in thinking about all of these kind of experiences with the dentist, you know, you can't really say much back, right? It's just kind of like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> um, so it kind of occurred to me in this moment, right? Trans healthcare is not just about gender affirming medical interventions, right? It's not just about the legislation that's preventing those things from happening. All of that is there, right? Um, it's also about medical care like dentistry right, which we don't really think about when we think about gender affirming care, right? There are these moments within each of these kinds of um, professional interactions where these things come up. Um, and it's not about just the patients, it's also about the providers. Um, and so I think that's really where my remarks begin, I suppose. Um, we know that trans and queer folks have all kinds of poor outcomes and experiences when it comes to medicine. We know the legal system is turning against us in many places. Um, and yet there remain these providers, um, especially in the places where this legislation is happening, where they are finding ways to share information. They're finding ways to provide care. 
they are finding ways to carry on despite the legal threats to their practice. Um, and I'm, I admit I am often rather critical of medical professionals, of the medical profession itself, the institution of medicine. Um, and so strangely in this moment of thinking about my dentist on, on the banks of the Rio, um, I found myself thinking, how do we support these providers who are standing with trans patients? How do we celebrate them without threatening their ability to continue to provide medical care to us, for us? Um, and so there's this whole group of trans medical providers, right? The people who need the support, it's not just cis providers doing the good work, right? There are trans providers caught in the middle of, of all of this legal firestorm. And so I wonder how we think together about how to support them, right? Particularly the trans providers. Um, they're very few. And they're dispersed, right? It's not like there's a critical mass of trans providers in one place that we can we can support, right? They're the only one, right? They're the only dentist in the state. They're the only gynecologist in a region, right? Um, I think I, I decided, you know, since we're all sociologists, I should maybe include some data in this talk. So I very quickly tried to find out how many trans medical providers or how many trans identified physicians there are in this country. And I didn't get very far. What I did find were some statistics for um, medical students. So there's something, in this, and this is dated, it's from 2020-ish, 2021, that 1.2% of all of the medical students in the United States identify as trans. Um, so that's not a huge number. I didn't go so far as to find out how many medical students there are in the United States, so my data is somewhat suspect. <laughs> um, but there's a small number of people who are trans, who are healthcare providers, some of whom are trying to provide specific kinds of gender affirming care, and some of them are just trying to extract teeth, right? <laughs> um, and how do we support them? How do we build community? Um, especially when you're somebody like me, who's rather skeptical of the profession and did a whole bunch of research to that effect, right? Um, so I'm gonna close by returning back to the water. And so at the start of this walk out to the Rio, um, there was a very slight drizzle, right? Tiny, cold drops falling individually, um, barely noticeable. And as individuals, right, we all might be angry, we might be afraid, we all have really big feelings about what's going on in the world. We might even feel hopeless. Um, and one drop of water or a series of single drops of water cause very slow change. Um, the change is there nevertheless, it's just really slow. But if a collection of drops occurs, right, that can change everything. It can burst a dam, they can jump a river, river bank, they'll smooth the roughest stone, they can create a tidal wave. So I always leave with questions. How do we form that collection? Um, or that ecology, right? Um, how do we bring together sociologists, medical practitioners, trans patients, and the families of all of us, right? It starts to become a larger and larger and larger and larger group, right? We're gonna have many opportunities to fight, to protest, to take actions of various kinds. I'm really interested in where the times are to come together to create this large steady mass that will continue to grow and, and sustain us through all of these things that keep happening and making us angry and scared and hopeless and, and all the things. Um, so I don't have answers, um, but I do wonder about the actions we can take as so many individual drops of water to build this flood that will hopefully inspire more fertile ground for trans folks to enter and change these professions um, to experience a training curriculum in medical school that represents their experience and ultimately to thrive. So that's what I've got. And I also want to read about the queer theory of life. So thank you all for being here. And <laughs> that's all I got. I need to know your dentist. <laughs> uh, our next presenter is Zakia Luna from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Can you hear me? Yay. 
Okay, uh, thank you for having me. And I love that without any pre-planning or really even any like email exchanges, <laughs> besides like, yay, we're excited that we're all gonna be on a panel. Um, I think we've taken some similar approaches, although quite different as well, um, but using local examples as inspiration. Um, thank you us for bringing us together for what I'm sure will continue to be a generative space for us. So I present you with a vignette. While it was a warm and humid day in Miami, Florida that July, the air conditioning blasted inside the hotel lobby. Low lights were on, although they seemed almost unnecessary with the sun illuminating the space. Low music filled the air, almost covered by the clatter of people talking in a variety of languages. A curving staircase spanned the back of the lobby. It would become the setting for various conference photos. The bottom stair ended near the floor to ceiling windows, which highlighted the main attraction that awaited guests, a deck with poolside service. Behind the deck, a wooden boardwalk went on for miles, followed by a dreamy expanse of beach that cuddled the sapphire ocean as far as the eye could see. To the right of the entrance, slick white floor tiles led to the official conference ballroom that would serve as the site for the plenaries of Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collectives, annual conference, let's talk about sex. Throughout the following days, hundreds of conference attendees would pass through that lobby. They would wear everything from African dashikis to peasant blouses to skin tight leathers. With shoes ranging from Converse sneakers to high heels, you know, attendees had their hair in cropped cuts, braids, afros, range of colors, some of which match Miami's flowers. And some folks were bald, right? They were various racial backgrounds and skin tones. Laughter, yelps, and multiple languages would fill the air throughout the day. The conference organizers noted that the Miami Beach location had been purposeful. Quote, we intentionally planned this weekend as a destination conference because we know how much reproductive justice activists work. It is nonstop and often we do not allow time to take care of ourselves. The three days were ones of joyous community as the reproductive justice movement convening space subtly modeled part of its goal. Right? To remind people, right, that human flourishing meant not just mere existence, but people being able to express their full humanity and have that humanity respected and even celebrated by the people around them. We understood, hopefully, <laughs> that this is what it could feel like if Sister Song had realized its mission, right? If we could eventually in the future really do what it claimed it wanted to do, which is to amplify and strengthen the collective voices of indigenous women and women of color to ensure reproductive justice through securing human rights. So that's an excerpt from um, my first book, which you can purchase later tonight. <laughs> uh, reproductive Rights as Human Rights, which focused on the women of color led reproductive justice movement and its engagement with human rights. And Sister Song right, really emphasized how reproductive justice rather than reproductive health or reproductive rights was very holistic, right? And about the human right to bodily autonomy and really the right to not have a child, have a child, or to parent the children that you do have, right, safely and sustainably. This includes people who don't ever want to have kids, people who want to form families in a range of ways, right? People who want to adopt, people who want to do a range of things, right? And I purposely started my book with a vignette from a moment of celebration at a conference because I didn't want readers to forget what people like the activists who I interviewed had been working towards, right? Not just what they were fighting against. Because it's really important to ask, what are you gonna create if you win the fight? What is the fight? Well, you know, the fight is real, as has already been <laughs> talked about in many ways, like the legal fights. Um, so in the world of repro, uh, 
you know, many people, in case you missed it, right? Monday, January 22nd, 1973 was when Roe v. Wade, right, passed. Now, lots of problems with Roe v. Wade's passage, lots of limits, and also, right, even though abortion wasn't the entirety of reproductive issues, as reproductive justice activists emphasized over and over and over, they also understood the way that, as Rosalind Pachesky talked about, you know, abortion is really a fulcrum of a much broader ideological struggle, struggle in the U.S., in which the very meanings of family, state, and motherhood and young women's sexuality were really contested. Right. The fight is also, you know, cultural in the sense of how do we people get people to understand the sort of common interests, even when these sort of cultural representations really emphasize separateness, which actually asks uh, in the introduction, <laughs> I was like, let me cross out my line that says, right, in so many ways, people think of reproductive issues, gender issues, concerns around gender expansiveness, sexuality, all of that is different. Right. Well, in preparing for this plenary, you know, I was looking back at some important writings, including Kathy Cohen's 1997 article, right, Punks, Bull Daggers, and Welfare Queens, The Radical Potential of Queer Politics. The article is still so good and so relevant. I considered just like sitting here and reading it to you, but I decided I should do something a little bit more than that. But one of Cohen's key points is about the necessity of understanding how we are all positioned differently in relation to power. And also that binaries, it's a queer and hetero, right? Don't address marginalization within any of these right categories. And for example, straight people of color engaging in non-normative sexual behavior, right? Such as black women on welfare who become single parents, right? Who are single parents, right? Are vilified by the state media and the public. And at the time Cohen asked, right? In narrowly positioning a dichotomy of heterosexual privilege and queer oppression under which we all exist, are we negating a basis of political unity that could serve to strengthen many communities and movements seeking justice and societal transformation? How do we use the relative degrees of ostracization, <laughs> all sexual cultural deviance experience to build a basis of unity for broader coalition and movement work? When I look at the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right through the Dobbs decision, it's in many ways a great example of what happens when many left-leaning people choose to not see interconnections, right? That others who are marginalized are saying, actually, these are connected. Hmm. Roe passed 1973, or ruled on 1973. The first restriction on abortion was 1976, right? the Hyde Amendment. For many repro folks are like, we know, we know. Not everyone is embedded in that space, right? And Hyde Amendment restricted um, people on Medicaid from being able to access you know, abortion through their health care, right? except for a few cases. And the Hyde Amendment was a budget rider, which meant that in order for the federal budget to pass, Hyde Amendment passed with it. So that meant each year, legislators, a range of parties were saying, you know what, it's okay for poor people to not be able to access abortion in this way. Right? And it is not uncommon in the US. Right? What's happening to poor people, how much does it matter? Well, Medicaid is a testing ground, many people have argued, including like journalist Stephen Thrasher, right? And various others. Fast forward decades, and yes, abortion restrictions have expanded well beyond Hyde, right? They expanded all the way, right? through what we saw with the overturning. But also you can look at other Medicaid restrictions. Right? For example, the Movement Advancement Project looks at how many states, and multiple states in the past few years have been slowly right, building in restrictions for Medicaid users to access gender affirming care. In some cases, right, focused on minors, in many cases much more expansively, including adults, right? For example, Missouri, the state where I live. So Cohen was really making this argument, right? About like, where do we see the linkages? Where do we see the interconnections? And since that publication, right, a very active and well-funded global, and we do want to be very clear, right? Global set of right-leaning actors, right? 
who are very ready to see the interconnections, actually. Very ready to see the interconnections between these movement efforts and systematically working <laughs> to either remove protections or codify lack of protections to get where we are today and to what is continuing to come to us and will continue to be coming to us, right? Now, since I started researching and then being engaged in the reproductive justice movement, I've seen the expansion in the sense of people's understanding of reproduction being a much broader issue than choice and abortion and applying to like essentially like family formation and also like how we want to live our lives just at a basic level, right? So these questions about solidarity are still so relevant. And you know, yesterday at the opening ceremony, S talked about this conference space this year being so much of a space of experimentation. And also saying like, you know, we don't actually necessarily know what radical inclusion is, we're gonna try. <laughs> you know, Angela Davis like reminds us that radical means like at the root, right? At the core systemically. And so what does it mean to think about shifting things at a very basic level? And as I was flying here, something I thought about was very basic about bodily needs. How many of you have been to the Kansas City International Airport? <laughs> A few of you have. <laughs> so on my way to SWS, um, I walked out, you know, it says transferring flights, went to the restroom, it said all gender restroom, green, he said, all right, went in. And the right hallway had like caution tape, so you couldn't actually like enter on that side. So I was a little confused and I'm like, okay, where's the bathroom? Oh, okay. And there's like this long expanse of like sinks that are sort of trough style, which always kind of throw me, but you know. then there are people like rushing past going to family gender stalls, right? And I was like, okay, they're going there. And I'm like, but, all right, this dude was like came in front of me and like took that spot. And then it's like, there's this really long hallway. And my eyes adjusted and I'm like, oh, okay, I can see. There's like this hallway and then there's like this grouping of individual stalls, right? If you aren't trying to um, change your kid's diaper, as someone was, I've been trying to with the family room. And honestly, I was just trying to understand like the layout, having just gotten off a plane and walking in. As I was also realizing like, oh, this is a massive all-gender bathroom, as they titled it. Not just the two family rooms that like, we're going to be jockeying for. And part of my confusion, I will admit, as a California gal, was I was like, I'm in the Kansas City airport. Oh, right. <laughs> and I was a little surprised and proud of Kansas City, right? Being, you know, back in the Midwest, right? These, these little moments and these little disruptions. And someone who looked like an older white man looked at me sort of standing there and said like, oh, it's all in one in here. And I was like, thank you. And I like, <laughs> you know, so I like walked down. <laughs> so I tried to find an open stall as more people were coming in. Cause again, this is an airport, which is always like people are rushing in. Did what I needed to as everyone else was. And I started to leave, but the sociologist in me was also lingering a bit to observe, right? all the moments of like confusion and difference and recognition on people's faces. And, you know, after I'd like fully left about down like the gauntlet to exit, some older, you know, like white women who probably looked to many people very stereotypically Midwest, right? Were exiting and they just sort of laughed and they were like, well, that was different. <laughs> but I think for me, what was particularly important was that for all these little moments and disruptions, like people were more interested in getting their bodily needs met <laughs> and getting to their flights or going home than anything else, right? They were just like, all right, I'll roll with it. And that brief disruption, right? And these sort of norms and expectations, right? These brief disruptions as sort of moments of hope. And I will give one more example in thinking about creating community spaces. <laughs> You know, I was at a reception last night talking with, um, catching up with a few friends and we were talking about, you know, interesting podcasts and books and the topic came to science fiction. And out of the blue, one of them asked like, well, what type of alien character do you think you would have 
let's say a relationship with. <laughs> now the two of us looked and stopped for a moment and then we were sort of cataloging and thinking and the friend's you know, question was so random, but it also got us into this really interesting conversation, <laughs> I will say. And partly because it was all about like imagination, fun and, and unexpected like delights, right? And clearly a disruption of the normal conversations that you have at conference receptions, right? Now, I am not recommending that you go up to a stranger at SWS and ask them about their imagined preferences for alien relationships. <laughs> but I really do want you to think about moments of disruption and imagination as we think about like, what does it mean to create, right? Radical inclusion. What does it mean to create utopia? Right? Now, we know that utopia if you get down to its Greek roots, it means like no place. Now people talk about more as like this imagined perfect place. Now we know this perfection doesn't exist, but radical movements are always about imagining new worlds, right? They're making demands that seem impossible, but those demands only seem impossible based on what people know of the world now. Going back to my book's opening vignette, like what would it feel like? if we had radical inclusion? What would it feel like if we had full human rights and our spaces embodied, right, the ways that we wanted to see the future? So I end with a question, which is what uncomfortable or fun or imaginative conversations and small disruptive actions are you willing to take to make, right, that utopia a reality? Thank you. Uh, our last speaker for this plenary is our global feminist partner, uh, Olga Plakhotnik from the University of Greifswald in Germany. We have about um, maybe 15 minutes or so for question and answer. Um, and I can walk around with this microphone so that you can speak. Oh, Barrett's got a microphone in the back. Um, but yeah, let's open up for some um, engagement with our presenters. Just raise your hand and we'll come around and hand you the microphone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for all those talks. Um, I think it's exciting that you all talked about um, issues of gender diversity. And um, I was, um, it's weird to hear my voice in the. <laughs> um, Zakia, I also was at the. <laughs> um, Kansas City Airport yesterday, and I went to the all gender bathroom, and it was very exciting <laughs> to watch everyone kind of like standing there looking at the sign. <laughs> um, and then I was texting friends like pictures because I took pictures of the sign. I was like, "Look, this is happening in Missouri," and someone wrote back and was like, "I thought Missouri had really." oppressive laws actually um, around this kind of thing. So um, I was wondering to know, cause you know about law, um, <laughs> like, I don't know, what is your sense of what's going on in Missouri? <clears throat> because there's this example of maybe some kind of institutional change in the airport, um, but then the larger laws in the state are different, um, so. Yeah, you might have thought you might have some more to say about that. Is this the one that's working? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Sunny. And yeah, I, I reflected a bit more after I also did, you know, some texting like, oh, and I also researched a bit more um, regarding bathrooms. Right? There's, you know, there's one in Newark Airport. Newark, New Jersey. There's also one in San Francisco, which most people are like, yeah, that tracks, right? I think about, now that I'm back uh, in the Midwest, the many spaces of resistance and small and large ways people are able to use bureaucracies <laughs> to enact uh, big changes, sometimes for things that many of us agree with, sometimes they've been deeply opposed, right? And the part of it is like, you know, I live in St. Louis and again, Missouri is, Holly is, well, I know, 
like the same state that produces Holly is also the state that produces like Cori Bush, right? Like there's space for, and the reality is like there's contradictions, right? There's people advocating for a range of things, just as in Missouri, like when Dobbs ruling came, <laughs> Missouri was already a state where there were very few abortions happening, right? <laughs> and but people had organized for years seeing the writing on the wall to like build facilities in Illinois, <laughs> right? Where the very, very different climate. I think just as with um, around the restrictions that many of us, right? are just like, how is this happening? Also around the good things, right? There's small groups, sometimes larger groups of very committed people who are working through like LGBTQ commissions, like in that case, we're going to KCI bathroom. Uh, and I also have not done a deep enough dive into like the fact that airports are also kind of federal, like where that, right, that's important, <laughs> which is also why it's fascinating, right, to think about like these multiple liminal spaces, right, federal spaces within a state space and are there other ways you can disrupt um, so maybe airports are the spaces where we need to be thinking about a range of interventions <laughs> to get people used to seeing a range of things happening in the spaces that they're passing through, normalize right, how they're thinking about things so that when they go off to wherever their destination is, oh, all right, okay, right. you can handle that, right? So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers enough for now. <laughs> And yeah, let, let's talk and take more photos. <laughs> Thank you. More questions? Here. Hi, um, my name is Mariana Nazella Prado. I'm a first year doctoral student at UW Medicine. So awesome in the Midwest. Um, I want to say that I love the idea of a post-binary world where self-determination uh, is the guiding light. At the same time, I wonder in this utopian scenario, where do you see institutional mechanisms like the government census? Uh, how would that look like? Especially considering that currently the census is not great at capturing any data on gender and sexuality. There are some conversations in demography spaces happening to be more inclusive, but in a utopian scenario where we move beyond this binary idea, where would a census, how would a census mechanism look like? Thank you so much for that question and thanks for the mic. Yeah, um, I think this is a really great question. I've given this a lot of thought. I'm teaching methods this semester, um, undergraduate sociology methods, and I have students who are coming to me to, to create demographic questions, and they have to create many iterations of them, as you might imagine. And this question is one that we've been talking about. What's the use of a gender question if it's socially constructed? What's the use of asking a relationship status question on a survey? It changes, it's meaningful, it may be the true for you and not true for your partner who's answering the same survey at the same time. It's complicated as an answer that nobody knows the answer to. And so I think of it's useful to document emergent and kind of diminishing experiences of social life so that we can see the changes. And just because something is documented doesn't mean that it is stable, rigid, and forever. And I think that we have to start thinking about our social experiences the ones that we report when we fill out surveys or forms at a dentist office or for an SWS conference, or the ones we ask people to fill out as true for that time period for those people in that moment, in that context. Um, and I think that's true for most of sociology, not just social gender. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, yeah. I was thinking about the comment about this project and the relationship between um, trans exclusionary feminism and state power and militarization. And one of the most disturbing trends that I've seen lately has been the way that the right in this, like, really the mainstream right in this really kind of frightening, like, war of maneuver has adopted these turf positions on the dangers of trans people to try to position themselves as feminists, as right wing feminists that are attempting to sort of protect, like, the sanctity of 
women's space or women's sports or whatever bullshit they're inventing. And like, uh, and I, in the spirit of like this idea of interruption, right. Of when we see these changes and when we see the kind of liberatory language that feminists worked so hard to create and the liberatory spirit that we've worked so hard to create being co-opted and stolen by these villains. Like what are methods of interruption that you think are useful, joyful, and can help advance our movement? Thank you for the question. I'm afraid I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> to that. Right. Um, you know, um some a couple of weeks ago, uh our students recorded a podcast uh, like interviewing me, and one of their questions was, Are you afraid that your idea will be co-opted or misinterpreted or used in a wrong way? And um, I answered that, that, well, it's not that I don't care, but I'm fully prepared for this. And now I, I just recalled um, a, a Sylvia Winter famous article when Sylvia um, named different liberatory movements and then after coma, it was until they were coped. So I sort of learn and I'm prepared that anything can be Coped and used for wrong reason. It doesn't mean we should stop or sort of give up. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. I think one is enough. Um, thank you. This was such a such a thoughtful panel. Um, I was going to tie uh, Zakia's question uh, with the last talk as well. Is airports at some level for many of us are spaces that are very, very scary. Uh, there is massive surveillance. There's exclusions, um, right, in terms of identities, identity cards, security checking, so on and so forth. Right, um, uh, extra, you know, scans and such that some of us uh, face more so than maybe others. Um, so, how would you juxtapose? And then the I wanted to tie that into the question of militarism, right? That that air uh, airports are intensely militaristic in that sense as well, right? It's not separate from. So, how do you see these spaces as potentially? Um, there's gaps and fissures that open up given that. Can, can you tell us a little bit more in terms of the kinds of militarism in airports and bathrooms as potentially liberatory in Kansas City? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you ask about like aliens and stuff? Like that would be different. I cannot. Ooh. My oh. fault, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't speak to everything going on in Kansas City Airport. Um, partially, I mean, it's also there's, I mean, there's multiple Kansas cities, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, different airports um, to add complications to the matter. <laughs> um, I was just struck by on one hand, a mundane, also sort of how unusual it seemed for many folks, and how also people got over it and were like, and also <laughs> need to use the bathroom, right? Like, and um, the sort of importance of like the physicality and the embodiment. <laughs> that doesn't mean that afterwards some people didn't decide to go like right to the customer service at KCI airport, right? But the fact is like those bathrooms are there. I did a quick little search, right? And like there's things on the news where people like 
newscasters going through and being like, here's what these bathrooms are like. What do you think? And I found, um, including in um, some alternative journalist papers, like um, a local sort of black paper. Uh, and they're like, you know, I never thought I'd live to see the day where I was just like sitting there washing my hands, right? With next to some older dude talking about whatever in the bathroom, right? And just sort of how mundane it was. Once you like get over the initial, as Sunny was talking about, like some people kind of noticing more actually than I did. And that kind of like, oh, I'll go in the rest of the I'm like, okay, I just assumed it was kind of a single stall thing. And then, like, oh, okay. Um, and I mean, you very important point though, right? That airports <laughs> are spaces of high surveillance, right? High, deep surveillance. And so then like, what does it mean though? That like folks organized, um, they don't think KCI airport was just sitting there, you know, on its own thinking like, hmm, let's just shift things up a bit and we're doing this renovation. I think, right, like there are people who are advocating around this, right? And so what does it mean that within the space, like people thought it was important enough to make an intervention within that space, right? Or Newark Airport um, and a few others. Uh, now there's even lists of like, you know, the best all gender bathrooms in the US. And I was like, okay, there's enough that there's now lists, right? Ranking them. And, <laughs> and I think that gets at, right, some of that complexity, though, because it is ultimately happening within a space where there are people, right, who are not being allowed to enter, right, through TSA, for example, or are allowed to enter and also then pulled aside into a room, right, and being interrogated around a whole set of things around presentation of self, whether around gender expansiveness, whether also like around rate, like who is more likely, right, um, multiple folks I know around visible disabilities that getting pulled aside, right, and really questioned around, right, um, uh, whether it's around chairs they're using or things like that, right? So I don't want to, like, romanticize it, but, you know, one thing, like, what does it mean, like, for these spaces of disruption that, uh, that I'll say in one way, like, I didn't even necessarily realize that there are people who are advocating around airport spaces, like, I'm in space airports a lot, as many of us are. <laughs> You're kind of like trying to be in and out and hoping that your flight <laughs> is not <laughs> delayed or canceled, right? So what does it mean to think about these very liminal spaces uh, and the work that you can do potentially to disrupt people's understanding, right, of the way society should work? And that's, um, I'm sure that there is someone in here who may be interested in writing a more in-depth Piece, right? And I know some folks are already working on these things, but uh, yeah, and it also felt particularly meaningful that I was on my way to SWS, <laughs> right, when, right, when um, in having this experience. So, uh, but yeah, I think it's a really important point that we're making, and Olga might have some things to add. Regarding, no? Okay. <laughs> and, well, um, regarding uh, the complexity of that space. So, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful panel. Uh, Let's give our thanks to these folks.